Hi everyone, welcome to my mini lecture for chapter one. This mini lecture will cover sections 1.1 through 1.4 as well as 1.7 and 1.8. There are other sections that won't be included, but we will get back to those at a later time in the course. All right, in biology, sometimes we talk about big themes or the big ideas, and we're going to discuss three big ideas of biology that are good for the introductory chapter. We're going to talk first about the hierarchy of life or the different levels of life, and I alluded to this back in the chapter four lectures. Secondly, we will discuss the movement of energy and matter in and through an ecosystem. Energy and matter are going to move very differently within an ecosystem, and it will be important to understand that distinction. Um, and then the third theme that we will cover are the characteristics of life, and that is asking what qualities does something have to have in order for it to be alive, and we've talked about that some during our activity in class today. As we move up in the various levels of life, okay, we may start with an atom, all right, and then work our way all the way up to the entire biosphere. But the real point of this slide is to, is to say that at each different organizational level, there are new or novel properties that come about at that level, all right. As I alluded to in the Chapter 4 mini-lectures, when does life emerge? Well, we consider life to be an emergent property at the level of the cell. Okay, not the atom, not the molecule, not organelles, but when everything is put together as a cell, then we consider that level just to have the emergent property of life. The hierarchy of life can be shown in words, a series of words, or sometimes it's better to use a series of pictures. And when you're looking at the organization of life, you can start from the top down, you can go from big to small, or you can start at the level of the atom and kind of build your way up to the entire biosphere. Okay, matters not which way you go. I think my personal preference is to start out small and get large. So we have the atoms. Uh, atoms would be put together to make a molecule of carbohydrates or a molecule of DNA. All right. We would take different molecules and they would come together as a structure within a eukaryotic cell called an organelle. Um, the example of an organelle would be the nucleus, as you well know. Okay, nucleus, uh, mitochondria, chloroplasts. Right. We group the cell membrane, the organelles, the cytoplasm together, and all of a sudden we have a cell, a eukaryotic cell. And it is this point that we say that the cell is living. So everything above a cell would include living organisms, and in some categories there will be non-living organisms. I'm sorry, not non-living organisms, just non-living entities like soil, water, air. All right. So we have the cell, and we can put cells together to make a tissue, right? nervous tissue, muscle tissue, bone tissue. We can then put multiple tissues together to make an organ. All right. Even the brain, you think of just being made of neurons, but that's not the case. There's neurons, there's astrocytes, there's oligodendrocytes, uh, there's blood vessels, all kind of things in, an, in the brain as an organ. We can then take the organs, several organs, and put them together as an organ system. That would be the brain, the spinal cord, the peripheral nerves, all right? And then if we take several organ systems, circulatory system, nervous system, put all of those together, we'll have ourselves an organism, and in this particular case, they've picked the brown pelican, and why not? All right, now, a population is simply a group of the same organism, the same species, within a particular area. 
All right, so if you are in the African savanna and you see a herd of zebra in a particular area, that's a population. Okay. Now, there are zebras in northern Africa, there are zebras in southern Africa, but those are going to be two different populations of zebra because they're not in the same area. All right. From population, we move up to community. All right. And community consists of all the living organisms in a particular area, not only the brown pelican, but everything else. Okay, other birds, a hippopotamus, uh, what, I guess you wouldn't find a hippopotamus with a brown pelican, but perhaps. Anyway, a community is, are all the living organisms, and please don't forget that plants are living organisms too. All right, from the level of community, then we then go up to an ecosystem. An ecosystem is simply the community plus non-living things in that area, all right? So for a pellet, you were talking about the brown pelican and other birds maybe on a beach or something, the sand would be part of the ecosystem, but it would not be part of the community. The waves coming crashing in, they would be part of the ecosystem, but not part of a community. From the ecosystem, we can put all of the ecosystems on the entire earth together, and then we will have our highest level of organization, and that's considered the biosphere. Right? And we think about the biosphere as the planet earth, but I want you to remember that there are organisms that live above the earth in the air, there are organisms that live below the surface, down in the dirt. So it's not simply just the surface of the world, but a little bit above and a little bit below. All right, these next three slides simply put in words uh, what I described on the previous slide. We do have to make one correction. However, these are slides from the textbook, and biosphere is fine. If we get down to ecosystem, you'll see that this definition is wrong, okay, just by what I said on the previous slide. An ecosystem comprises all organisms plus non-living material in a particular area. Okay, then we drop down to community, which are all the different species, all the different particular organisms living in a particular area. All right. Please know and understand um, and be able to put these different levels of organization in order. I really don't think it's that difficult. If you have any questions at all, just make sure you let me know in class. Thanks. All right, we'll transition now to the second large theme in this chapter, and that's the connection between matter and energy and the fate of both matter and energy in an ecosystem. All right, so to just kind of reintroduce and review some terms, um, organisms that make their own food are called producers. The most common producer that you and I think of are plants because they use the energy of sunlight to turn into not only energy for themselves by making carbohydrates, but also when we eat the plants, they provide energy for us. But any organism that makes its own food is called a producer, also known as in autotroph. Okay. Now plants happen to be photoautotrophs using light 
as a source of their energy. We also have bacteria down in the deep sea vents and in the hot springs that use funky chemicals like uh, hydrogen sulfide um, in, as an energy source. And those are called chemoautotrophs. But by far, the most common producers that you and I think of on a daily basis when we're in biology are the plants. All right? Now, any organism that either eats plants or eats animals that eat plants, those are considered consumers. All right? Our primary consumers... eat plants. All right, so another name for a primary consumer is herbivore. All right, we also have secondary consumers. All right, and secondary consumers can either, can either be carnivores Uh, if they simply eat meat, or they can be omnivores. All right, omnivores will eat both plants and animals. All right, so living organisms in an ecosystem have to interact with the non-living components, all right? Plants need water, plants need soil, plants need minerals, all right? Uh, animals need oxygen to breathe, they also need water. So there has to be this interaction be between living and non-living things in an ecosystem. In order for an ecosystem to function properly, two things have to occur. First, there has to be the recycling of chemicals, and by chemicals, I basically mean nutrients. And even more basically than that, I mean matter. Okay, so nutrients, chemicals, matter has to be recycled within the ecosystem. And the second requirement is that energy move through the ecosystem. Okay, notice the difference there, please. Matter is recycled okay, um, and stays in the ecosystem. Energy comes in through the sun, all right, and we're going to see that the vast majority, about 90 percent of that energy is lost from the ecosystem as heat. And we see those principles illustrated in this figure. Let's take the light blue, the cycling of chemical nutrients. All right. With the exception of the uh, ascension of our Lord into heaven and the assumption of Mary into heaven, all right, all of the carbon atoms, all of the hydrogen atoms, all of the oxygen atoms that ever were on earth are still here on earth. So literally... All matter basically recycles through the ecosystem. It may take thousands, tens of thousands of years, all right, but it will, okay? So it is possible, I always say it's possible, that you may have this, some of the same carbon atoms in you that the pharaoh, great pharaohs in Egypt had in them, okay? Anything's possible because the matter stays here in the biosphere and within ecosystems. Energy, on the other hand, is a one-way street. Energy, we generally think of... Sorry. Energy, we generally think of as beginning with the sunlight. About 1 to 3% of the sunlight is actually used on Earth by producers to do photosynthesis. All right? And the chemical energy, um, the ATP, that is generated uh, by producers is transferred on to the consumers as they eat to producers and so on and so on. All right. The trick here, as I've mentioned last year, is that at each level, at each different 
trophic level, there is only about 10% of the energy from the previous trophic level that becomes available to the next trophic level. Approximately 90% of the energy at each level is lost to heat. Now, is it entirely useless? No, we use heat to keep us warm, all right? Um, but that heat cannot do any work for us. We can't use that heat to make molecules of ATP. All right, so we've covered the hierarchy of life. We've talked the difference, about the difference between matter and energy in an ecosystem. Now we're going to transition to the topic of what makes something living, all right? And we can definitely agree that cells are living. I, I told you that. So this is just a nice place to kind of insert the difference and make sure that everybody is comfortable again with the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells, a synonym for prokaryotes, bacteria, all right, tend to be smaller and simpler. Eukaryotic cells, on the other hand, tend to be larger, all right. They have organelles that are separated by membranes. Multiple organelles allows for specialization within eukaryotic cells since they are larger. And basically, if you are not a prokaryote, if you're not a bacteria, then you are a eukaryotic cell. So plants, animals, fungi, protists all qualify as being eukaryotes. Here's just a quick picture that kind of reminds you of the difference in size between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, kind of reminds you also that prokaryotic cells have no organelles within them, okay? And just as a final minder, reminder, one of my favorite theories in biology is the theory of, you guessed it, endosymbiosis that helps us explain how eukaryotic cells actually evolved from prokaryotic cells. All right, now, the idea, excuse me. All right, I am so sorry about that. Um, the idea, that we have prokaryotes and eukaryotes, they may be very different from one another in size and complexity. But when we talk about the uni unity of life, we have to understand that there are some common features to every living organism, all right? And one of the most basic common features is the genetic or heredity, her heredity material of our cells. Okay, bacteria have DNA, eukaryotes have DNA. Not only do we both have DNA, prokaryotes and eukaryotes, but that DNA is made up of the same nucleotide building blocks, the A's, C's, G's, and T's of our genetic code. All right. Now, genes are considered to be a discrete or unit of DNA, a gene we generally think of as giving instructions to make a protein. All right. And we will go over all of that, how a, a gene encodes for a protein later on in its course. All right. So one of the big arguments that all organisms on Earth came from a single common ancestor is that we all share the same genetic code. The fact that we share the same genetic code allows us to put a human gene for insulin into a bacterial gene, and the bacteria can make the insulin for us. And just to remind you a bit of the structure of DNA, the nucleotides, Remember, DNA is generally double-stranded, so we'll have a T over here, a G, 
all right? And please, if this is new to anyone, don't panic. This is not Chapter 1 material, but it is a nice review and kind of brings it to the forefront of your mind if you've had it before. If you haven't, don't worry, we'll get there, all right? We're going to take the DNA, we're going to put it in the form of a double helix, we're going to compact it to make chromosomes, All right, and then those chromosomes will be stuffed and compacted even more into the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell. All right, so on to the properties of living organisms, other than the fact that they all have the same genetic code this, um, in the form of DNA. All right, the um, words got a little messed up here, but I think we can figure this out. In general, living organisms will have a sense of order about them, all right? We don't simply get up in the morning and ooze all over the floor. We have bones, we have muscles, and we most mornings are in good order, all right? Regulation, you see this, um, it's a hair, but you see how large his ears are? That, that actually helps him regulate his heat. He can either dilate or constrict his blood vessels to either warm up or cool off, depending on what he needs to do. All right. We also think of living organisms as growing, making cells undergoing mitosis and making more cells. A uh, child develops from an infant to a toddler to a teenager. All right. Energy processing. Um, Organis living organisms either have to make their own food or take in food in order to generate and to use our energy molecule, adenosine triphosphate. For the most part, organisms respond to their environment. All right. Um, even an animal as simple as a sponge will somehow have the realization of when food, their filter feeders, they'll know that when food comes through, through and the cells kind of capture the food and transport it to the entire rest of the sponge. Organisms in we say have the characteristic of being able to reproduce. All right, and I just want you to be careful about this. Not all living organisms have to reproduce, but as a species, at least some of the organisms within that species must reproduce so that life can go on and their species can go on. All right, and finally, we taught this word here is evolutionary, evolutionary adaptation. You can see this little seahorse, it's so well camouflaged in the picture. Um, in the process of evolution, species become better adapted to their environment, the organisms that don't die off. So we talk about evolutionary adaptation as being necessary for life, but I always want you to remember an individual organism cannot evolve, all right? Only populations of organisms over time can evolve. All right. In order to finish up this lecture, I just wanted to talk on one more topic, and that's the process of science. You have been beaten over the head since you've gotten to St. Cecilia and probably even in grade school about the scientific method. Please review the scientific method. Know the steps. All right. Ask, ask me if you have any questions about it, but we're going to kind of move on from there. All right. When it comes to the work of scientists, scientists generally use two different approaches. Either hypothesis-based science, which you are most familiar with, okay? That's kind of an if-then statement. If I do this, then I expect this result, okay? But and we talk about what makes a good hypothesis. It has to be testable. It has to be falsifiable. But a completely, almost completely different branch of science is that of discovery science. Discovery science does not work on generating hypotheses and then testing them. Discovery science just goes out there and finds whatever can be found in the world. So a good example of discovery science would be sequencing of the human genome. There was really no hypothesis. They just got out there and discovered exactly what was in the human genome. You can read this for a quick review of a hypothesis and theory, 
and understanding the difference between the two. And, and although we don't go through the, out the day generating hypotheses and testing them, we really do do it all, we do generate hypotheses almost unconsciously. Anytime we have to problem solve through the day or figure out why something isn't working, we may not state it as a hypothesis, but it's there, all right? If the flashlight doesn't work, you generate a hypothesis that either the bulb is burned out or the batteries are dead, okay? In my house, the batteries are always dead. Okay. But in any case, you generate, a, for a good hypothesis, you must generate one that's testable and is falsifiable. And this is where the concept of a null hypothesis comes in. And you're going to research that tonight. Okay. Section 1.8 in your book um, proposes an interesting hypothesis and discusses an experiment that was conducted to test the hypothesis. And I want you to read it. It takes a little, you have to kind of sit and look at it and sit with it a little bit and try to figure out exactly what was going on. But the whole hypothesis that they're testing here is that mimicry or one organism looking like an organ, another organism can actually have in like an advantage, all right, that th there are poisonous snakes and there are non-poisonous snakes, and if the non-poisonous snakes have evolved in order to look like the poisonous snakes, then they survive better in that particular ecosystem because the would-be predators n know to leave them alone because they look like the poisonous snake. All right, I'm not sure that made any sense what I said. But look over the data, um, look over the bar graph. Please make sure you understand in this particular experiment the difference between the difference between the control group and the experimental group. Okay, both of the control group and the experimental group are the artificial snakes, not the real ones in the ecosystem. This guy is the king snake. Oh, I'm so sorry. This guy is the coral snake. Okay, and the coral snake is actually poisonous. You'd want to stay away from him. And there is a saying that if yellow touches a black, you're a dead fellow. But if red touches black, you're okay, Jack. This species of snake is the king snake. And he's quite innocuous. You could pick him up. All right. I always get confused about the saying, so if I see a red, black, and yellow snake, regardless of what touches what, I'm leaving the area. Right. My hope is that you will be able to come to class tomorrow and be able to explain the difference between the data here, all right? What is the effect when the coral snakes are absent? What is the effect when the coral snakes are present? And why, can, from an evolutionary perspective, how can we explain that, all right? Thanks so much for your patience. I know this was a little wordy lecture, but hopefully it made sense. Bring me any questions you have tomorrow. Thanks.